Hello and welcome to Pots and Trows and this is the first of our new series Yay. or season yeah. as I think it's called. It's good to be back. Season's I've missed world. doing this actually. Yeah, we missed too. a few weeks haven't we? Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. I it's, missed you Sean. It's felt quiet. Well you keep wandering off without me but I'm just going to keep <laughs> closer tabs on you this series. I'm going to be there. Yeah. yeah. Well we've got all sorts happening but just to let you know this is the first one but we're going to carry on right the way through we've decided till next mm. August. Yes. That's Continue. the plan. Then we'll that's have a, the a few weeks off for a little break so we're going to be with you for a long time. And today you'll be able to discover what Jill and I found when we paid a visit to Matt at Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. Mm, and we've got um, some questions. So we've got, we're have got we talking rhubarb with one of our questions. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> no, rhubarb. <laughs> yeah, no change there. And then Andrea, um, our top fan, is uh, asking for recommendations for wisteria. Oh, fabulous. Um, Martin, go on. I'd better get thinking of a neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Martin's got some top tips uh, for your tomatoes, which uh, are probably still going at this time of year. And also it's bulb time. It's bulb time. It's bulb o'clock. Oh. It's time mm. to be dealing mm. with bulbs. Mm. Anyway, look, uh, Martin's better at that sort of stuff than I am. And if you're listening to this uh, but on your YouTube, you can see us because we've done a video one for the first time. So hello, we're waving to the camera. Uh, if you're not, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but let's uh, now go over and find out how Martin and Jill got on with Matt at Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. <laughs> Well, we're out and about a bit at the moment, aren't we, Mrs Fish? We are. We're down in Hampshire. We've been actually been visiting some family uh, down in Hampshire and we couldn't resist a stop-off to say hello to one of our good friends, our Pots and Travels friends, Matt. Yes, from Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. Yeah, because he's not actually very far from where we've been staying. So, uh, so we've popped into the nursery and we know we're in the right place because there's a couple of dinosaurs at the, uh, at the greenhouse entrance. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, if you're wondering what the dinosaurs are all about, we visited Matt at the Hampton Court Flower Show, did a, a video for our YouTube YouTube channel which you can find yeah. uh, and he got two dinosaurs on he his did stand. They were fantastic yes. part of the display weren't yeah. they? And they're very tame as well, they let us have a stroke. <laughs> so we're coming into the big glass houses now so this is where... Down at the bottom of the greenhouse here. Exactly, this is where he grows all these amazing insect eating carnivorous plants. So we're actually walking through these large commercial glass houses and there are thousands there and are. thousands of we're in the Saracenia house Yes the and moment. there's yellows and greens and this gorgeous sort of burgundy colour as well all the, the trumpets, I'm not sure the technical terms but know, well, we're going to find Matt out because now we're going into this smaller glass house the inner sanctum and this is it looks like it's the nursery where everything is grown in here and here is Matt himself who is uh, surrounded by all these baby insect eating plants hello Matt how are you Hi, doing Martin. how are you Hi, Jill. great well so tell us where we are what's this glass house we're in this here is, this is the prop house that's about 20 by 40 and this is where we grow more of the unusual varieties, either from seed or division or cuttings. Um, and you can see here, these, these are young Saracenia seed. These are this year's. And you can see they're tiny, they're only tiny, about a centimetre they? or so. Yeah, that's all, isn't it? And how tall, only about a centimetre tall yep. as well, aren't they? Yep, but they've them. all got three, four, five, six, seven of the little trumpets. Yep. Yeah, the, the first two leaves are, are, are non-carnivorous. And then all the leaves after the first pair uh, tiny little right. tubes or little trumpets, trumpet pictures. Yeah. So how long does it take this, this, these are this year's seedlings and these are probably aren't even an inch tall are yeah. they, but they look like little miniature versions. How long does it take to get to one that's maybe a foot tall? Oh well, so, so from this, this is another year on and to get to one oh, about right. a foot tall is about five, six years. Oh, okay. oh really? Yeah. So it's a long process then, very, isn't it? Very slow. Uh, and, and Saracenias, um, if anybody's watched the video, and if you haven't, as I said, it's on YouTube, Saracenias are probably what were the main plants on your stand at Hampton Court. Um, so just, just remind listeners, what, what is a Saracenia? Uh, the Saracenia, they're, they're a North American pitcher plant, and the range in habitat is from parts of Canada, so they can tolerate very cold weather, down to about minus 25 centigrade, right the way down the eastern seaboard, so that's down through New York State, North and South Carolina, down to as far as North Florida. So they're not down in the Everglades where you'd imagine them to be. They're up in the northern part of Florida. Then they go <clears throat> over west through Alabama, Mississippi, over into Louisiana, and just a little bit into Texas. So that's where you'd find them in the wild. And they are pretty tough, aren't they? they you know, these plants, we, we all think they look very tropical mm. as if they should come from the tropics, but they, they will stand cold weather, won't they? That's right. It's very misleading. They just look tropical, don't they? I mean, when you look at one like this, they're yeah. quite elaborate and colourful. Yeah. You would think that they come from the Amazon rainforest, but yeah. no, they're from 
the States, North America, and they're, they're relatively hardy, yes. Okay. Uh, and other plants that you grow in here, I've noticed there's a... Have you seen this, Jill? This little tray just here. The little baby baby Venus flycatcher. Well, they're even smaller ones here, look. They're yeah. tiny. So, again, are these grown from seed? These were grown these from seed. So these are about a year old. And these ones here are from leaf cuttings. Oh. So they're much quicker. But just going back to the Saracenia quickly. So these <laughs> here are a year old. Now, this is a rhizome cutting. Right. So I'm, I'm, I should show you this because it's a much quicker way to produce them. Yeah. The rhizomes are very similar to an iris. Yeah. So the growing point you remove and plant up the back part of the rhizome above soil surface. And then they'll start to bud. Oh, you see the bud see coming out. Yeah. yeah. And here. So this one here, this is only about two years old. So you'll get a mature plant in about three years as opposed to oh, six. So, so it's much quicker. So if anybody's got one and it's getting bigger and you've yep. got these fleshy, rooty rhizomes, rhizomes, you can take some basically rhizome root cuttings off them. Mm. As long as you've got at least a couple of inches or, or six centimetres or so of rhizome, you can remove that, plant it up above soil surface and you'll get young plants mm. emerging from the rhizome. Mm. Yeah. It's a good tip. So back to our little Venus fly traps. <coughs> this was what started the business off for you. This is what, it when was. you were a child, gave you the idea of growing these fascinating plants, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, that's the one that I'd seen on television and with David Bellamy, I think it was, and uh, that's what captured my imagination. And yeah, we're still growing them now. So yeah, yeah, that was the one. But th that's the, I think I said to you before that's um, that's the one I'm least interested in yeah. now. These are my favourites because yeah. we hybridise a lot, and you yeah. can make. Plants. Yes, I mean, and you, because with the Saracenias, you've actually bred and introduced quite a lot of new cultivars, haven't you? Yes, yeah, we're all, every year we've always, we've, we, we make at least 10, 15 crosses a year, and you need the room, as you can see, to grow them on, and then we pick the best of the best out and select them out. Yeah, we've got quite a few in cultivation that are available all around the world now, actually. Yeah, right. quite a few. So how you just say we hybridise them mm. as if it means nothing at all, but, you know, can you tell us briefly what that process yeah, is? Well, um, you've seen the nodding flowers outside there. The, the nodding flowers, we remove the pollen from the umbrella, which is the like an umbrella-shaped part of the, of the flower. The pollen's removed, and then we, we touch it on the stigma, and then... At the end of the season, around about September time, the ovary swells up and then it starts to crack open. It looks a bit like an orange, actually. And there's about four to 600 seed in each one. And then you hope, fingers crossed, that if you cross a big green one with a short pink <laughs> one, you want some really big pink ones. Yeah. But you might end up with a load of uh, short yeah. green ones. Yeah, so it doesn't yeah. always work. No, it doesn't right always way. work. No. But that's why you've got to grow so many of them on yeah. and then pick the best of the best out. And after three years, weed out a load more and then you start selecting out. And hopefully ones. you'll get one or two that are going to be new special varieties That's that right. you can then yeah. have yeah. produced and you, to, to bulk them up because obviously you can't just do little divisions and rhizome cuttings because you need enough to sell you, you have them micro propagated don't you? We, we, tr we, we try to but it's it's very tricky because if you if you don't get them micro propagated you're quite right Martin that it's just so slow mm -hmm. from division even like even in yeah. this way it, it takes a lot of time, but if they're really sought after, they're really good, then some of the big nurseries, so a lot larger than us, will put them into microprop. But okay. we're always looking for microprop labs that would do s short runs of plants for mm. us. Yep. Mm. Now, I'm going to test Mrs. Fish now, Matt, oh, because, yeah. Jill, yes. when we were at Hampton Court back yeah. in the summer, Matt <laughs> gave you a couple of plants, a different type of a carnivorous plant, and there's, yeah. there's a tray of them over there with those beautiful pink flowers. Can you remember the name of them? I can, and they are pinguiculas. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Martin really struggles <laughs> with that did, name yeah. for some reason. So yeah. I, I kind of learned it, so I was ready to prop him when we were doing exactly, a talk. Yes. Or the butterwort. The butterwort, yeah. yes. And, and they're, they're very different. They don't have the trumpets that catch the, uh, the, the, the insects. So how, so how do they actually get their nutrients? Yeah, well, it's, it's good that you picked that one, Martin, because carnivorous plants, people think think it's a large family of plants mm. but they've all evolved in different ways in different parts of the world and they're not related to the Saracenia at all so these look more like a, I don't know African violet it does yeah pretty little yeah. deep pink flower isn't it yeah and the, the, where they got their name from is the leaves are very sticky and it feels like touching a pat of butter it's mm. quite slippery can you feel that Jill yes, yes it is and you can yeah. see the scarab fly yeah, yeah. And they're very, very good at catching scarab fly. 
and they do work very well. So indoors on the east or west facing windowsill, they'll mop up all your little scarab fly that you get out of your compost. Or compost nuts are also known as. But yeah. 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 Well, they're working while well. we've got a couple on our kitchen windowsill where we've got some house plants and they're, they're doing very well. They at, are, aren't uh, they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eating yeah. The With the bonus fly. of the pretty flowers yeah. as well. Yeah, that's what they're grown for mainly. They're, they're lovely. And this particular variety comes from Mexico. So they're well suited as a, as a house plant. Mm -hmm. There is a couple of hardy ones that can be grown out in a in a bog garden, but these are mainly candidates for for, for indoors on a window. So right. and they're okay. very free flowering, as you can see. Lovely. Yeah. There you yeah. go. There no, they are. So now we noticed when we walked in past the dinosaurs. I mean, you've got the glass houses here, uh, lots and lots of plants, but you've got some that you grow outside. So can we have a wander out and have a look at those? Yeah, we're going to have a look at those. Okay, yep. right here. Follow. I'll follow you, Mrs. Okay. Fish. Off you go. <laughs> It was amazing in Matt's greenhouse, wasn't it, Matt? I wish you could have been there, Sean. It was it was just unbelievable, just this sea of Saracenias. It was, yeah, incredible. I, obviously, I've seen the pictures from the video that you've taken at the show, mm. and uh, they look like incredible plants, just a, a really, you know, interesting look to them. In fact, actually... Yeah. As we are here in video, there are some on the table. So if you want to see them, go over and have a look at this podcast on YouTube. But yeah, um, just really interesting shapes, aren't they? They are. I mean, and I always think they look so tropical. But as Matt mm. says, they grow in cold areas or stand a lot of frost. But yeah, Jill's, it's Jill's new little hobby now. Well, um, yeah. Insect eating plants. <laughs> She's trying to get a really big one for me. <laughs> well, apparently, oh, no. In, no, when they are growing in, in the wild, um, there are great big big ones that have been known to to have a rabbit yeah, inside yeah. more you know a bigger oh, I, mean, I think bigger you mentioned animal. yeah and, and mice and rats yeah, and things yeah, like this yeah. oh, I can't Thankfully imagine I'm yeah. bigger than a rabbit <laughs> it's, it's, it's giving me Jurassic Park vibes you know that whole kind of it, yeah it is a bit isn't it prehistoric yeah. um, <laughs> coming up later in the show uh, we've got some jobs and some listeners questions um, and obviously more from uh, Hampshire carnivorous plants. Um, just remember, if you've got a question for Martin or anyone on the team, drop us an email, info at potsandtrials.com. All right. Yeah. I think rhubarb. We're talking rhubarb. <laughs> and we've got Marley here and he's chasing pigeons at the minute, which you might be able to see on the camera. But if you can't, I've, I've got my little uh, tin of... Dog treats oh, here, I ready you to bought me some sweet here. <laughs> I thought they were for me, a little mint. Oh, there no, was a little heart there, but I it's uh, anyway. I'm trying to give dog biscuits. Off. <laughs> He's a romantic. <laughs> right, rhubarb. So we've had a question come through on YouTube via the YouTube channels for one of our videos, uh, and he was watching. A gentleman was watching one on rhubarb that we did. I think it was. I can't remember when we did a rhubarb. It was one. how was to it divide a rhubarb ago? plants. Yeah, a couple okay. of years back. So his father-in-law, who's now sadly passed away, a couple of years ago planted some rhubarb probably about 20 years ago so it's going to be a fair old mm. crop isn't it um, and his wife and he noticed that the past two years it hasn't been growing as bountifully as it has been in previous years this year is definitely the worst so the one that martin you dug up on the video is probably slightly smaller than their biggest one. He was going to follow the steps in your video in the hope that he can revive this clump of rhubarb. But as it's now early September, should he wait for the spring or can he go ahead and do it now? Good question. Uh, and I think that would be the one we dug up in Dennis's garden a few ah, years ago. So it was that a while one ago. had been in the ground for a long time and mm. it was looking very starved and unnourished wasn't it really it was. and, it, and it, we've actually got a piece growing in our garden and it's now doing much much better and mm. um, some people do it in autumn some people do it in early spring i favor the early spring to be fair mm. but uh, if you want to do it wait essentially till it's all died down so probably another month you know once we get into late october all the foliage has died down uh, and once you've taken all that away you could then dig it up divide it and replant all i would say is if you've got a wet heavy clay soil I would probably wait and do it in late winter early spring because you don't want the root when you divide it it's quite a big woody root you don't want all those sort of cuts in the root being exposed to too wet uh, a soil in the winter mm -hmm. so if you've got a nice loamy free draining soil then do it but otherwise wait until late february march when you've got the first sign of growth mm. and and really 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 improve your soil lots of 
uh, compost, if you can get manure, to give it a really good start. So we planted Dennis's clump in our new garden, didn't we, yeah. a couple of years ago? And I did get some stalks from it this year, but I didn't pick too many, no. which I was told not to do. Not the first season, is that yeah, right? That's I remember right. That. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So hopefully next year, and I, I love rhubarb and ginger jam, and I made a big batch of that, but we're just about coming to the end of it because I couldn't pick too many sticks. So hopefully next year... Well, I'll be able to lots. give you a jar of rhubarb and ginger. Sounds good. You reminded me, actually, that I uh, just received the King's Seeds catalogue. Oh, uh, yes, we got ours as well. And uh, on the back of it, um, King's Seeds do uh, sponsor our videos for full disclosure of people listening to the podcast. So if you want a discount, go over there to our videos, check that out. You can find out a discount code. But anyway, um, the point being that on the back is like a planting guide. Absolutely. And yeah. this is a new to me because I normally just go, Martin, what can I plant this time? <laughs> yeah. And I was looking through it, and one of the things on I'm sure it was rhubarb. Uh, Is that well, right? you can from do seed. rhubarb. I actually did some this year from seed, um, and it's made quite nice little plants which will be ready to go into the garden. I've got them in pots at the moment, and they'll mm. be ready to go. So you can have one of them, sure. Oh, even better, even better, because I've spring. still got an empty raised bed that I'm yeah, wondering what well, to do with. So then yeah. we've got some rhubarb you can have. Just, uh, just from seed. how, uh, interest of transparency, how many rhubarb plants are you going to be planting? Because well, we have got two big clumps already. Three, three big clumps <laughs> already. Yeah, but I've got, you know, we're very lucky. One of our neighbours <laughs> has got a spare pot. Oh, you've got... I was, I was, <laughs> and, sorry, uh, just, just for, again, for people who are listening and not watching, I'm looking around the garden thinking, where is this going to go? <laughs> yeah, no, this is the back garden. There's no vegetables in this part of the uh, garden. But no, we've got a little plot across the road in a neighbour's garden, mm. so I've got three more clumps growing there. I'll be able to set up a stall selling yeah, rhubarb exactly. and ginger jam <laughs> at good. the end of the season. Sounds good. <laughs> Right, and then another quick query from Andrea Bradley, who's one of our top fans. Uh, Andrea asked us a question about what she could plant up her pergola a few weeks ago on one of our podcasts, and she's wondering about a wisteria. Well, what, we what mentioned she... that was one that we recommended, a wisteria. Right. So she came back and said, can you recommend a variety of wisteria to okay. plant up the pergola? Mm -hmm. You've got this lovely oak pergola in the garden um the, the only one that we've ever grown so it's one i can talk about with experience is one called prolific uh, and we've had it on the last two houses uh, growing up the front of the house and and it is beautiful it's got lovely long sort of bluey lilac-y racemes mm. of flowers in may so that's the one i would go for you might need to do a bit of searching andrea to find it but it's out there and it's i think it might even have an rhs agm which is mm. an award of garden merit which tells you that it's a good one but it is a really really worthwhile plant and your one. top tip because i've heard you answer this on question oh. and answer sessions when we're at the shows is always buy a wisteria that's got some flower showing if you can oh. because then it avoids any mix-ups with labels because yeah. i've heard lots of times where people have bought a wisteria and it's not been what they expected the flowers have been a different color so um, if you so can see the flower at the point exactly. of purchase yeah, yeah. Okay. but if not just get it from a reputable supplier and you should be safe with okay. that one Ooh, nice. fantastic just nice. a reminder then if you've got a question for the martin or the team drop us an email info at pots and trials.com um are we going to hear some more about carnivorous mm. plants oh, yeah let's go back Well, we've stepped outside the glass houses now and we're in Matt's garden. Um, and surprise, surprise, more <laughs> Saracenia. So instead of herbaceous and rose borders and beds, you've got Saracenia beds. So what are these? Because these look fantastic out here. <laughs> well, what we did uh, during lockdown, um, we knew that some people grew them, out, grew them outside and with, with some success, so we thought we would have a go. So we built these raised beds, which are a sleeper on top of a sleeper, as it were lined it with a, a plastic liner or butyl rubber liner and filled it with with a grow medium with peat and planted the plants up and they've been extremely successful as you, mm. as you can see um positions i found is very important these are in full sun as you can see martin from sunrise to sunset they're in sunlight all day, yeah. all day and the plants are very very wet mm. so the key is keeping them wet all the time if they dry they will die. Okay. Remember that. That's a good one to remember. And, and yeah. when you say keep them wet as well, they need soft water, don't they? Yes, we've got we've, we've got very hard water down here. In, in we're, we're near Winchester, so it's very chalky. So we collect all our rainwater. We've got a couple of tanks, uh, quite large tanks, about fifty thousand gallon storage, and that is piped up 
as you can see yeah. into the bits. Now surprisingly they don't need that much because it's there's no holes in the membrane by the way so right. the water under there is like a reservoir under the plants and it lasts quite a long time we find we have to water it two or three times a year believe it or not so in the winter months it's almost overflowing and these are out all year round so they're yes. not taken because they're actually planted into the growing medium yeah. um not in pots and these the because these were done lockdown so these are going to be four years old now aren't they yeah. sort of thing yeah. and and they've just made huge clumps so what about winter temperatures what what sort of temperatures do you get down here in um, hampshire the coldest we've had here is minus 10 c and they were in solid blocks of ice every year since we've constructed these we've had them freeze but prior to this we did a a trial for the RHS which was a five-year trial and we had them again down as low as minus seven but minus ten is the coldest we've had mm. them yeah and we found they all survived they didn't all thrive but they all survived so some are definitely better than others okay so anybody wanting outdoor ones you can advise which yep. would be the, the hardiest but there's still loads of beautiful colors because you've got the, the tall sort of yellowy flava ones and the, mm. the dark red ones and short ones squat ones all different shapes and sizes some sort of lovely pink and white ones as yep. well yeah no i've been i've been very surprised we've we've planted virtually well we have now planted all species out um with some degree of success there's a couple that are a bit different. This Saracenia leucophila doesn't seem... It survives, but it doesn't thrive. Okay. Um, yeah. And there's it's another one. Narrower. Yeah, it's narrow. Yeah, it's narrow. You can see, yeah. and, and not as substantial as Saracenia yeah. flava. And this one grows in the south, normally down in Alabama, where it is quite warm. Oh, right, OK, yeah. And also another one we've got over there, which is called Citacena, which is a very low rosette-forming plant which by itself is not very good, but when it's crossed with purpurea, you get this one here, which is called cortii, oh, yeah. which is very successful. Yeah. So They're just you... such beautiful, rich colours as well, aren't they? Oh, and I mean, it's August, well, no, sorry, beginning of September now, but Martin, you should see them April when all the flowers, they have lovely flowers as well. I mean, yeah. so there's not many plants that have very unusual, you know, some people say pretty foliage, mm and lovely flowers as well absolutely and yeah. what would happen to these now because you say we're into autumn uh it's still a sunny day down mm. here and as it gets cold you just let them sort of die down naturally over the winter yeah we leave them alone at the moment some of the varieties are still to grow more pictures so some of them some of the hybrids especially they'll keep on growing pictures you know they come up very pale like or anemic and green but in the sun they, they redden up so these are relatively new pitchers so they'll carry on growing pitchers i find until about the end of October. Oh, right. And then as we move into November, December, that's when they start to, to die down, like, well, like any herbaceous perennial, I suppose. Mm. And then um, you can start cutting them back down. We don't cover them. We don't mulch them. We just leave them. And um, as I say, this can fill up with water because mm. it's got a plastic liner and they freeze solid. And then the following spring, usually around the end of March, they are slower than the ones under glass. Mm -hmm. It's a bit warmer in there. And at the end of March, beginning of April, they start to come up with the flowers first, followed by the traps and pictures. Right, they are amazing. I know you've got a question, haven't you, Jill? Well, I have got a couple, because I'm noticing on some of them that sort of halfway up the the picture, there's an, a, a sort of brown, looks like the, the plant's sort of rotting, mm. uh, or the picture bit is rotting. What? Why Why have they got that discoloration, Matt? Yeah, I, I know. I, well, yeah, well spotted, Jill, because, I mean, that can, people do worry about this. Yeah. We get a lot of phone calls. They yeah. say, oh, my plants are dying. Uh -huh. It's not a problem, it's where we call it indigestion. It's where they've <laughs> caught so many flies so quickly and before the, the, the leaf or pitcher has hardened off and it sort of burns through to the outside. But the good thing about this is that next year you'll find that the plant will have a big spurt of growth and produce a lot more traps. Because essentially these, these pitchers, that's the way of feeding. So the flies go down into there, they, uh, they then rot uh, and the nutrients in those flies is what feeds the plant, it's their own making their own food isn't it exactly um so yeah. the more they feed this summer the better they should be next year presumably. that's right we, yeah. we, we find that that's why out here they tend to grow a lot quicker and a lot bigger than the ones under yeah. glass because they're just catching so much yeah. insect material and as you say they're not taking any nutrients or food from the roots so the root system on these plants is very meager and all that's doing is drawing up water mm -hmm. 
And when you can see how many of these plants have caught, some of them are virtually full up to the top. Yeah, if you look down you there, we there can there. see it. Oh, yeah, it's Whoa. horrible. It's like uh, fly, <laughs> fly soup, isn't so, it? Yes, so we do it. get asked a lot, say, so, oh, well, there's not yeah. many flies around yeah. our way. I would think, oh, well, we've, that's the least of your worries. They, yeah. they will catch enough. Yeah, because yeah, I was thinking with the quantity of, yeah. of these plants that you've got, do you get enough flies to feed them all naturally? Yep, yeah, they do, and, and they're quite specific in, in what they feed on the... We find they mostly catch green bottles, um, oh, yeah. blue bottles, yeah. uh, hoverflies, wasps. They don't tend to catch. They don't catch honeybees. The odd bumblebee will sometimes, because they're a little bit clumsy, but will why, sometimes why? fall. Why is that? Right, because they're, they're attracting scavenging insects. They produce a nectar around the lid, which is quite sweet. Out here, you can't smell it, and under glass, you can smell it. It's very similar to, to golden syrup, I suppose. So that attracts scavenging insects. They eat it and they move down to the neck of the pitcher where it's very slippery. This nectar also has an intoxicating effect on them so they get a bit unsteady on their feet and they slide down into the pitcher. Now you wouldn't think they'd be that effective because yeah. flies are quite sprightly yeah. and they move around yeah. quite quickly. But these are by far the, the most efficient of all the carnivorous plants and as you've seen, They've all caught flies. All yeah, of them. you can yeah. see, yeah, which yeah. is what they're doing, yeah. It okay. is um, and so clever. But and let's go back in time a bit. How did this all evolve, Matt? You know, because these didn't just appear from nowhere, did they? No, it's, it's a really good question. Like, like we've, we've been asked that, and I've wondered it myself. How did they know if they made yeah. these shapes, yeah. they would catch, catch flies? Mm. What it's, came uh, first, the Saracenia them, yeah. or the fly? Yeah. yeah. Well, the flies had to come first for them to be something to yeah. eat. So we, we know that for sure. But, yeah, I mean, if we looked earlier at some of the Heliamphora, which are a very primitive Saracenia, you can see it's almost a leaf that has curled around to form a tube. And they don't have any digestive fluid in them, the Heliamphora, where these are a lot more evolved with a lid, which stops rainwater diluting the digestive fluid in them. Yeah. So the Saracenias are a lot are a lot more evolved than the Heliamphora pitcher plants. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating how they've evolved though, isn't it? Very and that's because so. they naturally grow in peat bogs where there's no nutrition, so right. they've got to make their own. So I suppose that's a, a bit of a, a reminder to anybody growing these, you must never ever feed it with a liquid feed or no, fertiliser. No, never feed them with liquid feed. What, what they do, um, and we've done this before, mm. It's almost reverse evolution, which is very quick. What they'll do, they'll produce quite flat, non-carnivorous leaves. Yeah. And what pictures they do produce are very small and don't have very much coloration in them because they don't bother trying to attract flies because they're getting uh, enough them. nitrogen. Yeah. And also, you'll find that they do that at best and at worst, you'll, you'll kill them by feeding them. Right. Okay. So it's quite a slow process pushing them on. Yeah. They, they are amazing. And having these, you know, you've got these four beds out in your garden that are absolutely full. We'll, we'll get some pictures and, and put them on our Facebook Yeah, because I'm having a quick scan around. You haven't actually got... <laughs> <laughs> There's some trees planted, but there are no herbaceous borders no. or anything. Which else. I think the trees are underfed and overwatered, yeah. Martin was saying. Yeah, right. Very similar to these. <laughs> so we're down here at your nursery in Hampshire. You're not open all the time, but you do do open days and special events. How can people find out about that type of thing, Matt? Yeah, we're um, hansflytrap.com is, is our website. And on the homepage, you'll find a full list of our events, including flower shows we attend throughout the year. But... Yeah, come on down to one of our open days. It's a real eye, a real eye opener, yeah. and you'll see how we grow them. If you're growing them already yourself, you might think, "Oh, we'll try and do it like that, or we'll yeah. try and grow them outside." It yeah. might be inspiring to to get people to grow them. And you're going to start doing more events, sort of like masterclasses, where people can come along and learn from you, the expert. Mm. Yeah, that's what we're going to do, and um, we've been asked for this a lot, and it's a lot more hands-on, so you can see what to do right in front of you. Because uh, however much you look at them on YouTube it's good to see yes. you know a hands-on approach yeah. and you can ask questions that you're not sure about yourself which yeah. might be when are, you, when are you going to start that Matt next year okay. next year so that's we'll 2025 20, yes. well I mean you've got into these haven't you? Since I we, have you know you you really like them well I do we've got the butterworts on the windowsill and we've got a drosera as well Ooh, but know, we haven't got any saracenia so perhaps no because we, we've I'm just thinking we've got a little we've made a little hard standing area in front of our greenhouse um, maybe we could do a, a. We've got some old stone sinks, haven't we? Mm. Could we do something Perfect. in something like that? So yep. again, line it. Like if you've got a stone sink or concrete, I find it's best to line it with a polythene because 
concrete or, or c cement based is quite limey and that can leach oh, into, right. the, okay. good point. into the medium so yeah. a little plastic liner yeah and plant them up in there yeah, yeah they do very very well okay. yeah. i think this is potential birthday and christmas presents for, you <laughs> for years to come you know who wants diamonds and silver and gold anymore when i can buy these off map map do i get a discount yeah yeah, yeah there you go yeah. Matt, still <laughs> Matt, it's been brilliant. Thank you for showing us around. Uh, I mean, we've seen your displays uh, at the flower shows and they're amazing, but to come and see the nursery and them growing, yeah. as it were, in the wild is just truly amazing. Yeah, but do check out the YouTube video as well uh, from when we were at Hampton Court. Yes, and we will come back another time with a camera here. Yes, yeah, we should have brought it. I told oh, you yeah, we well, should have brought it. It's your fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Jill. So it's official then. Diamonds are no longer a girl's best friend. <laughs> oh, uh, oh. And I need to look for some sarcemia for my wife, do I? Is that, is that where we're at? Yes. I mean, for years I've often been wanting to buy Jill a deep fat fryer <laughs> for Christmas or a birthday. And that's gone down like a lead balloon, just as did the ironing board, to be fair. But, but with the Don't insect try eating it. plants, I've got a bit of leeway on that. And a bit, mm. you know, I think Jill, because we've now got a little collection growing. We've got some in the house on the windowsill. We've got some saracenias, mm. which are going to live in the glass house over the winter yeah. uh, and come out into a sunny position so I think that's it presents forever so go for it Sean brilliant excellent yeah. stuff I, I just, work, yeah. and your boys would be fascinated by them to be fair they would I mean I was fascinated when I was their age you know sort of 10 12 of Venus flytraps yeah. but having watched the video we've done um, with um, you know, the carnivorous plants um I probably triggered it far too many times yes. and yes. killed it, yes. let's be yeah. honest. So yeah. uh, that was a, a point that they've only got so much. They can only yes. have so many times yeah. and the, and the yeah. insect has got to be moving. So if you drop a dead fly in, that doesn't work. Mm. And I think, uh, Matt, and also we we spoke, uh, we did a podcast uh, back in the summer with Pete Walker from uh, Wax, Wax Wicked, Wicked Plants up in North Yorkshire who grows a very similar range of plants, an expert grower. He was saying, you know, people often feed them bits of cheese and yeah. things like that, which you can't <laughs> do. They won't eat that. <laughs> they are not vegetarian. They need live flies to survive. But while we were chatting to Matt, he actually showed me on the Saracenia picture, because I was calling it a trumpet and it's not, it's a picture officially, okay. but yeah. there was that little bit of dead, it looked like it was dead in the middle. Right. And Matt actually cut one of those off and opened it up uh, where it had all died off in yeah. the middle mm. and it was just it was you know the Garibaldi biscuits oh, yeah, like squash dead, dead fly, fly biscuits, biscuits. Yeah. essentially that's what yeah. it was like in the middle and it was all just these flies well I know Ooh, listening I mean, on the it was podcast pretty gross. you can't see this but we've got one of these Saracenias on the table with us because we're outside and it, Sean see that little dark stain oh, on yeah, this okay. picture no, that, yes. that is the, the acid that, and if you look down there you'll see that's where it's yeah. overeaten full yeah. of flies it's oh, horrible isn't gosh, it so yeah, it's flies if we tip them out you've got flies soup oh fantastic so, yes. pre pre-digested fly soup yeah okay i think we need to move on to jobs in the garden this week because right. much as that looks appealing <laughs> maybe marley would like it he's yeah, uh, no. he's sniffing for something in the background absolutely not dead flies hopefully well yeah just a few things you know because here we are now uh, third week in september i mean we're when this goes out it will be the 22nd of september which is the equinox mm. uh, in the northern oh. hemisphere we are now officially in autumn mm. uh, so it is the first day of autumn and it feels autumnal but we thought we needed to be out in the garden mm. um so things are starting to come to an end in the garden now we've had it quite dry some places have had a lot of rain but we've seemed to have missed it so the garden is still okay and lots of flower but in the greenhouse it's the mad tomato harvest and mm. jill is busy processing tomatoes so if you've got tomatoes still in your greenhouse uh, and you're struggling to get them to ripen take a few more of the lower leaves off uh, close the greenhouse at night to, to keep as much warmth in there because we had our first frost last week uh, and it got down to zero in the greenhouse so it would have been lower than that in the garden in fact the courgettes are all crispy now all the leaves have gone yeah. crispy mm. so um, just keep as much warmth in the greenhouse as you can and keep feeding with a bit of potash and they will ripen over the next few weeks mm. um, also want to mention that it's bulb planting time uh, we've just come back from a flower show and we're at another one very soon and and it's bulbs wall to wall there uh, all the lovely spring flowering bulbs are on sale now so with the exception of tulips which we'll cover in a few weeks all your daffodils and your alliums and your crocus they can all go in the garden now 
And the rule is three times the depth of the bulb, just as a guide. So however big the bulb is, dig the hole three times that depth, put it in and fill it back. Uh, and put them in pots as well, of course. You can put them mm. in pots. Um, and I think our video that's out at the moment mm -hmm. is... Making lasagna. a lasagna pot. Making a lasagna oh, pot with yeah, three yeah, different yeah. layers of bulbs in there. We've done it before, years ago, but we thought we needed to do a little refresher on that mm. one. Okay. Um, uh, keep cutting dahlias. Dahlias are so popular at the moment in the garden. Mm. Uh, mm. And if you keep cutting them, although we've had a frost, it wasn't enough to damage them, thankfully. So we should get a few more weeks of dahlias um, because it's one of those, the more you cut, the more you get. And then finally, um, if you want to save any seeds off any annuals you've got in the garden or anything like that do it while it's still dry before it gets horrible and wet and soggy so you know just make sure you get a nice envelope get the seeds in let them dry um, and you can have you know there's quite a few things lupins and all that type of thing you can quite easily save a few seeds from your garden sorry Martha I just got distracted because <laughs> literally oh, a gone. fly fell oh, into Sarah Senior in front of me another one bites the it's dog. the same one that's already you showed me <laughs> oh, is already dark no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. um <laughs> We're not quite a rose pruning season. Is that um, in a month or so? Yeah, a bit early. I mean, they're still flowering. I mean, we've got one or two still flowering. Mm, yeah, that was garden. my question because I've been deadheading thinking, am I wasting my time? With Deadhead? Keep deadheading, Keep deadheading Sean. Okay. Yeah, because that will... If we get a mild autumn, um, then there's no reason why they won't carry on flowering for another several weeks okay so yeah keep dead head but not actually physically pruning them not down pruning we'll, okay. we'll save that till november all right fantastic and then the other thing i was listening you were obviously mentioning the tomatoes there and ours are outside so ours will be experiencing low temperatures but um yeah we might just make some green tomato chutney you've been yeah. picking some red though yeah we've got red some ones. lovely red ones yeah uh, we have also we had some yellow ones we didn't know what all the varieties were because mm. we were given these plants mm. so it's been interesting but as i've mentioned before i didn't do a very good job of spacing them mm. so i turned into some some kind of massive tomato jungle which <laughs> meant that i didn't always know which tomato was off which plant yeah, yeah. not and also didn't know what the plants were anyway so hey like, it's been a bit <laughs> potluck yeah and also the other thing daily uh, i was dis was destroyed by slugs so oh, we only right. had one daily you say marley had eaten it <laughs> well it, uh, maybe it was could be maybe it was <laughs> when we were yeah. watching we'll get you going again uh, next year yeah, with some. yeah yeah fantastic <laughs> well i think are we about there then we are just we about are. there we're going to be back again next week in fact next week i'm going to be talking to the curator of the Logan Botanic Gardens in Scotland. Oh, that's so really interesting. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. We look forward to that. Well, we'll see you then. See you then. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Wave to the camera, boys and girls. <laughs> Watch the videos on YouTube or Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter or X, and subscribe to the podcast and never miss a thing. For more information, go to potsandtrials.com.